to me, come to me, come to me. Where's the guy? Come on, step out, step out, step out. Both of you, step out. Hi, I'm Joel Persinger. I'm the Gun Guy. Thank you very much for all of your support of Gun Guy TV. I'm very, very grateful. You can support the channel by going to Gun Guy TV Crew, and you can find links to Gun Guy TV Crew on both Patreon and Locals in the description. Please do check me out on these other locations because YouTube does censor me periodically, and with being in an election year, it's likely to happen more. Both X and Rumble do not censor me at all, so I do urge you to check it out over there. What are we going to talk about today? We are actually having victories in the state of California, but I think it's important to understand how the battle is being fought and what the current battles are. While we do have victories, the fight isn't over by any stretch of the imagination, and unfortunately, it's also heading to a state near you. So if you left California and moved to other places, guess what? The California fight is coming to your zip code whether you like it or not i've got rick travis from the california rifle and pistol association to give us an update on sb 10, what is it uh, 1160 i think and some other bills as well as what's happening in other states so let's go talk to him we got some good news i mean i it there's been some funky news flying around too you know which i'll get chuck on i guess and he can talk about the whole court stuff but you've been up in the legislature uh, yep. Along with Sam Perez and others, causing them all kinds of pain. I love it. So, so update we, us. <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's, so what's going on? We've, you've killed some bills. You've got some good news. Yeah, uh, we, we, we need good news. We'll take it. Yeah, so we have some really great news. But I, I want to put that news in a bit of a framework, if I might, Joel. Um, we have a bill package this year that myself and Chuck and Sam and others have labeled every gun, every gun owner. And the difference between a bill and a bill package, which I've tried to explain to our community, is a bill, say like Senate Bill 2, is a standalone bill. Yes, it's in a great sea of anti-Second Amendment bills, but Senate Bill 2, as you know, dealt with sensitive places in focusing largely on just CCWs. It doesn't need another bill to make it work because everything's encompassed in that bill. Another strategy of the left is to pass what's known as a bill package. And where a bill package is differently is it usually has three, five, seven, there's usually an odd number of bills that come together. And the concept is you want to pass it if you're the people, the proponents of it, you want to pass all of it. But the idea is, well, if I can't get it all passed, if I get a couple of these passed and I come back around year two, year three, and eventually assemble the package. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think it makes sense. It's kind of like, I mean, it's sort of a shotgun effect. They figure if they get a piece, they can come back and get the rest later on. Right. And so where the every gun, every gun owner is really important is throughout history. In fact, our own history turned 49 years ago. Our government, the British government at the time, came to take our firearms away. And the idea was once they took them away, they could completely control us as British colonials. And of course, on April 19th of 1775, we didn't just say no, we said heck no, and start a little war that had some shots heard around the world as the story goes. And uh, here we are, turned 49 years later, free from British rule, but also still fighting the government over gun control. So that's like a two and a half century heritage where this has come is you know throughout the years various groups goa uh nra and others have said mandatory confiscation is coming and i think to a degree that has been overused in the past and so people have been like yeah 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 we've heard that but not so much this year in california there is a bill package that is exactly that and so it started off with portentino and senate bill 53 uh, which stated clearly, Joel, that you know you have to have your ammunition, your firearm in two separate areas locked up, even though we've had three different Supreme Courts, um, the one in McDonald, the one in Heller, as well as the one in Bruin, not the same makeup, you know, different players, all said, yeah, you, you can't do that, Joel. Kind of violates, oh no, it does violate the Second Amendment. That's illegal. It hasn't stopped Portentino. 
And that would be a typical one-off build. But where the package gets moved is in, we have another build that's brought forward that says you will have mandatory firearm safety devices bill. And so that is in a bill that was put forward by, um, uh, I'm going to think here for a second, Manshine in 30 AB 364, which states that you have a gun safe. I have a gun safe, Joel. But our gun safes don't have a DOJ laser imprinted label that says they've been approved by the Department of Justice because it didn't exist before this bill. The only safe per AB 53, Portentino's bill, that would be compliant is one of these new safes in Manshine's bill, forcing you to have to go get a new safe if you're going to be compliant. Now, a lot of people listening to this are probably like, well, I'm not doing that. Like, forget it. Just not doing it. Because we all realize the safe you presently own would be worthless in California, and you're going to spend a lot of money for this new safe. But that's not enough. Because then you had 1160, which was Portentino going, well, now that we are going to know that you're putting everything in your safe, everything has to be registered. Every firearm in the state has to be registered. And all of those firearms will include an initial fee of about $250 and an annual fee of about $125 designed to break the bank. And then you're like, well, how are you going to force that compliance again? Oh, well, we're going to turn your firearm safety card in um, Senate Bill 1253 from Gonzalez into an actual license. And if you don't have that license, then you have to turn all your firearms in. And still the question would be, well, how are you going to know? And a lot of people said law enforcement. But if you look, Joel, and we've talked on your program before, you can look at like LAPD. LAPD did not enforce the, the high capacity magazine. They just didn't do it. Like, no, we're not doing it because the officers on the street understand the Second Amendment. They weren't going to cross that line. So that means going back and Stephen Halbrook, who is a great two-way attorney that's written several books on the history of the Second Amendment globally, said hey, in his book on the Third Reich, you have to look that it was the Weimar Republic that said they couldn't trust law enforcement, and so they switched to other agencies to start enforcing these laws, of which when the Nazis came to power, they took full advantage of. So what does California do? It says, we're going to take the Department of Insurance in Gibson's AB 3067, turn them into the security force, because your insurance agent, business, home, car, boat, train, plane, automobile, everything. And they're going to question you where you have your firearms and how you secure them. And if it's found when you have to use your insurance that you didn't tell them, they don't have to pay for anything. So you paid for your house insurance, but they find you have a gun that you didn't register, didn't store properly. Yeah, the insurance company doesn't have to pay anything. So it turns the insurance companies into the policing agency for the legislature. That was the package they brought. We were able to mount a, a huge coalition against 1160. That was our first thing that Sam and I had discussed doing. We did it. We represent over half a million Californians going in there. And uh, Portentino pulled the bill and it died this week. Now, a lot of people in our community are like, yeah. And yeah, we did our little happy dance too. But those other four bills are still in play. And we have to defeat those. Otherwise, somebody else next year won't be Portentino because he terms out. Somebody else will bring a light bill to 1160 to try to get through to make this happen. These five together set up mandatory confiscation, which is why we have to stop all of them. So the good news is, Joel, we, we destroyed 1160 this year. But the ongoing news is those other four have to be taken out. So and then this is the burning question. Where, where are we with the other four? So 53, which is the, the firearm storage from Portentino, I don't know if he's going to be able to pull it through. We have till May 17th for these bills to move from the House of Origin to the other house. It's not up yet. So we may be able to kill it this year fairly good. Um, I'm going after the firearm safety certificate. Ironically, it may be humorous to some people here. Um, I had a couple of people call me afterwards and go, did you just say what I think you said? And it's like, yes, because I was trying to throw the old bicycle wheel, you know, put a stick in it to make it flip over. And so as Gonzalez came in, she was very sure she was going to get this through on the first pass. And um, I brought up the point. I said, well, that's interesting because the Democratic Party in California 
is very concerned about the criminalization of migratory populations. And she kind of nodded her head, because I only get two minutes, as you know, up there. And I said, so how does your mandatory license work since the federal gut courts have said that migratory populations can have firearms? They obviously don't know what an FSC or HSC or anything like that is. So you're instantaneously going to turn them all into criminals? And that caused the Democrats on the dais to go, oh, wait. Got to go back to the drawing board. So, so it's okay. And I'm sorry to rant here. It's perfectly yeah. fine to turn American citizens into criminals. Right. But Lord forbid that you turn illegal right. aliens who've come into the country illegally into criminals. Right. This is this part of the reason I share that is because this is the craziness that we have to use to fight some of this stuff. But that has caused this bill to slow down as far as the property insurance this is the area that we're, CRPA is investing a lot of time um, in basically starting to build an alliance with the insurance companies, which obviously they're driven by money, but to say, like, you don't want to allow this to happen for you to become a police force for the legislature, because then they'll make you do that for a lot of other things, which will impact them. So it's taken a lot. I think we're going to be able to, to knock it out. The one it is going to be extremely hard for us right now is Manshine and the roster, because as you know, this state loves to pass roster bills. And so we're, we're hoping to get that stopped because it's unconstitutional, not to mention it's unworkable. And that's one of the things we're trying to tell them. You know, we've talked to the manufacturers of safes and these safety devices. They're not hipped on spending $50,000 per every device to get their little labels on and, and having the state of California show up at their factory wherever USA to put those on. And so as a result, um, it's going to be very hard to make that one enforceable. So I think it's a pretty good shot we have of knocking out at least four, if not all five this year. But the point is, they're not going to give up just in one year. And part of my messaging today uh, with you, Joel, is, you know, and I know you hear this all the time, and I've seen some of the comments when I've been on your show that of, uh, well, that's why I moved to insert wherever they moved to, or that's why I'm moving out of California to wherever they're going to move to. And ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you, I have spent time in the last two weeks with the legislators in Colorado, Wyoming, um, and I have conversations ongoing with people in, in Oregon, Idaho, and Utah, so a good chunk of the West right now. And the conversations basically surround three items. One, we do not have the legal staff that CRPA and GOC have in California because our lawyers haven't had to fight this stuff. Secondly, we don't have the infrastructure you guys have built to fight this stuff. And thirdly, all the antis have cut their teeth fighting you, and now they're showing up here. So we kind of feel like we're little leaguers going up against pro, you know, we use the metaphor, pro baseball players. And... This is really difficult. So we're spending a lot of time, Sam and myself, and Chuck and his crew with the Second Amendment Law Center in going in and helping to reinforce those areas because all these bills are, are being replicated in those states. Are we seeing this happening in the states that you mentioned, or are they just kind of getting ready in case it does? No, it's right now the 11% tax that we called Assembly Bill 28 is in Wyoming. It's in Colorado that they're trying to get it through. And... Uh, that's, you know, I, I just got done prepping their entire coalition trying to stand up against it. But the thing is, they said, oh, well, do you know this individual? I'm like, yeah, they're from the Giffords group. It's the same person that Sam and I faced off for the better part of three years inside testimony. So this guy has dealt with us for three years, and now he's going into a brand new group that has never had to deal with this. And they're like, what do I do during the headlights moment? And so... That's one of the things that I need people to understand, too. GOC and CRPA are working literally throughout the Western United States now to help build all those groups up and get them ready because they have to fight now and they're going to have to fight hard because all of the junk from here is now moved to those states. How important is this election season as a result of all this? I mean, you say we're winning in the courts and that's nice, but that's and I'm grateful yeah. But that's sort of the last ditch battle at uh -huh. the end. Right. And and it it's extremely expensive and it takes a long time. And it strikes me, you know, I'm just a neophyte at this, which is why I have you guys come on and talk <laughs> about it. But it strikes me that 
if we don't have if we don't participate in the elections and we don't make sure that the we elect the right people that those judges can be replaced that the supreme court can be changed as mm -hmm. much as we don't want it to be and then we could be losing in the courts as well so we can't i, I don't think we can rely on the courts as the be all and end all of this can we no elections elections are our primary uh that we have to do that and obviously the national election for president is huge for the same reasons you just said supreme court appointees and federal court appointees but at the local level it's important because that's where you get your local county courts and you know the superior courts of each county as well as the state courts and one of the things I will I will say right now on this show is we have a current thing happening in our primaries that should set everybody and tell them to shut up once and for all. And I don't normally talk that way to people, but literally, we need to shut up about my vote doesn't count. If you look up into district, I think it's 16, Evan Lowe's district, there we have the top two vote getters, as you know, in this state. I don't like that, but that's who gets to go to the to the end. We have a dead heat, 30,329 to 30,329 for second place. And this is in a world where, okay, look, I, I, I have the same thing, okay? And I say to myself, I have to slap myself sometimes, which is why one cheek is redder than the other, you know? I have to slap myself sometimes and go, no, you, your vote does count. It's important that you vote because I think that we get this sort of mythological thinking or disaster. Maybe it's not mythological. Maybe it's yeah. just self-destructive where I say, well, my vote doesn't count because the other side cheats. Uh -huh. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, the other side cheats. Uh -huh. But if we don't vote, we, we, they don't need to cheat. Well, well and right? let's be honest. And I, and the other side, I'm sorry to cut you off, but the other side is okay. cheating has went on since the election of 1800. Anybody with a rudimentary political science background will tell you, yep, Jefferson and Adams cheated in 1800 on each other and that threw things off. We've seen it all the way through. We have Lincoln's second, you know, I think had Lincoln not been assassinated, history might not have been so kind because Lincoln literally shut down areas to vote during his second election. I mean, there's been lots of things that went back and forth, Republican, Democrat, Okay, so let's at. all right. So let's just be completely. Let's just t <laughs> rip the bandaid off the darn right. thing, and let's be completely honest. You do this for a living. Yeah. Is it a fact that both sides cheat? Yes. I, have both sides always been cheating? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I can rant and rave and say the left cheats, and the left says the right cheats, and you know what? I think we're we're both correct. Yeah. And it's why Lyndon, one of my favorite, Lyndon Johnson, not my favorite president, but one of my favorite quotes is, there's a reason politics is the national pastime greater than baseball because the same amount of cheating goes on. <laughs> okay, so if you're watching this thinking you can't say, we can't succeed because the left cheats, trust me, our side's cheating too. Yeah. Okay, and I'm not sure the person who cheats the most wins, but I do think that there's a potential that, you know, the yeah. cheating cancels each other out to some degree. But if we don't vote, right, we and might as well be helping the other side cheat. <laughs> that's, that's the problem. That's, that's what I'm going to tell you right now. That is the weapon of both sides. They want to make you not trust and divide because then you'll become apathetic and won't vote, and that's where they get power. But the more of us that show up, the more of us that do this, the less power they have to influence things and, and rope us in. And so, and the other part of this too is, you know what? There's a lot to be said for, you know, why do people buy certain brands? You know, let's just be honest, blue jeans, denim is denim. Now I know I probably offended like a bunch of people that are all into that by saying it, but for the most part, blue jean is a blue jean is a blue jean. You know, unless you're really into fashion, you're not looking at someone's rear end to find out what brand they wear. But having said that, can I point out through our lifetimes, Joel, when it wasn't cool to wear Levi's, you had to have Wrangler, you had to have this, or when I was a kid, you had to have tough skins, you know, whatever it may have been. But uh, why? Well, because you didn't want to be on the outside. You wanted to fit in. So when more of us are out there saying, this is how we're voting, this is what we're doing, there are people that are on the fence that want to fit in, 
and they join you in that vote. And that can help win elections. Well, the reverse is also true, isn't it? I mean, the more noise that says, ah, the vote doesn't count, the vote doesn't count, the more people want to belong to that. So they say the vote doesn't count, the vote doesn't count. Right. By by the way, I'm of the opinion that, that so much of that that happens on social media, social media seems to run everybody's brain at this point. I think the more of that, the most of a lot of that that happens on social media is just propaganda. I mean, it's... It's trolls, it's bots, it's whatever. The whole yeah. idea is to try to change. I, you know, maybe I'm nuts here, but the whole idea, I think, is to try to change the way people think and push them to think that they can't succeed. And then we get, you know, we're on, I don't know, pick a social media platform too much. And the next thing you know, that's the way we're thinking. I think sometimes we got to shut those stupid things off. And as my father would say, use our head for something besides holding our ears apart and stop letting other people tell us how to think or letting computers and bots and propagandists and so on tell us what to think. We got to start thinking for ourselves. And and people, you know, you don't have to believe me. You can go to like the American uh, Political Consultants Association, look on their website, and you will see they literally have classes on how to use AI, how to use all these different things to influence what you just said, social media and everything what to buy for your client to push your narrative, which is propaganda. Well, this is just really such a, you know, you, you said it's the national pastime, like, you know, baseball. It really is a game. I mean, I, mm-hmm. it's a terrible game. But the last time you came on, I mean, you went through some of the gamesmanship that happened happens behind the scenes. And for me, at least, that was incredibly educational. I, I, I think just the idea of this, what did you call it? You called it, a, it was a bunch of bills put together. A package. You had a, work, a package. A bill package. I didn't, it never dawned on me that they actually did that. I thought a bill was a bill, but they're playing this game of stitching these together uh-huh. so that even if they if they got five or six of them, if they don't get all of them, but they get one, then they can come back and try to get the next one and the next one and the next one. This is uh, this is like Stratego, that old stupid strategy game we used to play when we were kids. This is crazy. It's like a well, war. It's, you know, everybody tests whether it's with your spouse or significant other, your family, your your church, whatever it may be, a policy change. And there's two ways to go about a policy change. There's the straightforward, honey, I want to sell the house. And I want to move to Norway, and I want to take up being a Viking. Okay, that's a, a big policy change. And probably are going to get told in 99.9% of those cases, no, not happening. But if you start the thing of, hey, um, I thought it'd be really cool to go to a Viking like weekend. And then I thought about maybe let's get the house fixed up and see what it praises for. And let's take a trip to Norway. And well, those things are a package to make a policy change that in the end will become palatable because it's incremental. That's where I'm trying to help educate our community because sometimes they try to do the little incremental and sometimes they shotgun the whole package out and say whatever doesn't make it across, that will be next year to make that policy change. But the most important thing with this every gun, every gun owner is the gloves are off, the masks are off, they are going for confiscation of firearms. That's where the left wants to go. And they're no longer hiding. Are are we proactively doing the same thing the other direction? I mean, are, do we put bills together like that and so try to play that game on to, our side? We're starting to. There's been some wrestling in behind the scenes amongst different groups. Um, as you know, when I came into this position, I decided we would have capital days and not rallies where we actually got Second Amendment people trained in, in the offices pushing our agendas. And we're, we're about to do that again this next week. Um, and so we just had a, a big training with all of our people going up to to do it. And we have another one this earlier um, this next week before we get up in Sacramento. We've also started working by changing up some of the institutions within Sacramento and getting some bipartisan people put together. We have some outstanding people on both in both parties that will defend the Second Amendment. And so we're working with them to get some bills basically through that are palatable to the left that build that infrastructure up to start steering this. But very rarely does the legislature move like a speedboat. It's more like an aircraft carrier group, which means if you're trying to move the carrier, you got to have a lot of tugboats slamming into the side of it. And so that's what we're doing. And it's we're starting to see the turns in some areas. 
but that's causing some of the whacked out people on the bridge to start throwing stuff at us like Portentino. But the good news is, folks, um, half of those people are gone at the end of this session. As we are those people being replaced by people who are not so severely uh, at to this the left? Point, yes. At this point, that would be fairly true. There's a couple that we don't know yet. Um, and there's also several elections that look like we may flip some seats. So there's there's a lot of ground being moved. Um, we could see a break in the supermajority. We could be really close that the supermajority wouldn't be solid. And that's something you got to realize, too. You know, if you can look at the Congress, I mean, how many times do we see in Congress where the Republicans couldn't lose, couldn't lose, and then you get six or seven Republicans that break out of a body of 435 and the Republicans lost. The same is true. We're getting that, that gap narrowed enough that if one or two Dems break or don't vote, the supermajority doesn't hold. And that is a dynamic change in the state legislature. So you have these people who are very, very uh, hard left. Uh -huh. And many of those are leaving or quite a number of them are leaving, the Portentinos and like that. And then you replace them with people who are still left, but maybe they're kind of center left. Does, uh -huh. that, does that change the game in our yeah. favor a little bit? But it's also what people need to realize and celebrate the victory was the Dems believed that our community could have zero impact on their elections. That was the belief going into these primaries. And so when Hurtado had turned on us on Assembly Bill 28 and became the, the major proponent after telling Sam and I and others that she would not vote for it, and she became the chief spokesperson 20 minutes later, we told her afterwards we were going to come for her in the congressional election. And we did. And she didn't finish first. She didn't finish second. She finished fourth. She's and done. That, yeah, she's done. She's done. Now, she's still in inside because um, she still has time to stay in the, the Senate. But she is much, much quieter on the Second Amendment, all this stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, and, oh, that's good news. <laughs> and so part of that is the message was sent. They're starting to realize we do have teeth, we will fight back, and we're pushing that narrative. And we've also come and helped some other candidates get to a point where the Dems said, no, the Republicans can't get close enough to flip it. And now they're, like I said, there's a half a dozen seats right now that potentially could be flipped in the, in the November election. You know, going back to 1160, I think one of the most telling things for us was when Portentino went to carry that bill. That bill was obviously written by... Um, members of the anti-second community. It could have been Giffords. It could have been Brady. It could have been every town. Um, I'm not for sure which one. I, I suspect a couple of those as being just the way it was written, that they wrote it, because it's very similar to other bills that they've written. Um, but they didn't show up in support. They know showed him. And to do that to a prominent person who has, like, carried your your water for you, for 12 years, like Anthony Portentino did for those groups, also sent a message to other senators who still have time left under terms of like, well, wait a second. You know, he lifted all this weight and the money, the support and everything wasn't there the moment they realized he wasn't going to be there and wasn't moving anywhere. So this is a, a guaranteed relationship. And they're seeing where we're guaranteeing that long as you side with us, we're with you no matter what. And so going back to what Sam said, you know, hey, their job is getting reelected. Well, they're going to have staffs going, well, why are we carrying these people's water? Because that may not be as effective as we thought it was. On the main, if you were to just take a, you know, sit back and look at where we are and where we're going, do you do you have a positive outlook for what, yeah. where we're going or a negative one at this point? No. I'm very positive for a couple of reasons, and, and I can tell people, yes, this is like the most egregious thing, this bill package, but I'm thankful for it. And people are like, what? <laughs> and here's the reason, because I fought in our community, as I've shared with you several times privately, with trying to wake people up and going, no, seriously, the, the wolf has, has got rid of grandma's clothing and is full on coming at you, and people are like, nope, still just like grandma. We can trust it. Now there's no doubt. Like there's zero doubt. There's zero place to go. Well, they, oh shoot, they really did mean this. So I'm thankful for this bill package because it eliminates that. Oh, come on, Rick. 
really now it's like oh this is real yes so wake up smell the coffee and join the fight and get in it so now you got somebody who's just finally uh, the realization has hit him in the face like a brick how do they join the fight CRP has been asked this a lot recently. We have put a lot into what is called our chapter program. And within the chapter program are legislative teams that I meet with twice a month. And so if you really want to get involved in this fight, those teams receive training, talking points, and they help us when these bills come up by going to members' offices, by using many tools that we provide um, to them to be able to be a force to be reckoned with. And so... If you want to get involved in this political fight and become part of a team that is growing to as well over 250 people statewide now and growing and having an impact, and that impact was felt this last week because um, in Avalon, where we're fighting to save the mule deer on the island, there was a issue that came up before the city council, and that team was able to flood the city council in less than six hours with over 5,000 email letters saying, do not do this. And that led the city council to deny the memorandum of understanding that would have led to the slaughter of the deer. So um, we're very effective, which is why I'm very, very happy. And you know, I don't like this stuff, Joel, but I do have confidence because I'm seeing politics move in the right direction. And I'm seeing people wake up. And I'm seeing people come together because they realize we are fighting for this country and for the republic. So is it all just gray-headed dudes like me? Nope. And you, or are we, yep. got, we got young people involved? I mean, what's the, give me an idea of what the swath of people look like yeah, who are swath, involved in this stuff. Yeah, the swath that's going up to the Capitol um, are comprised of people with various gender orientations. We have men and women. About 40% of the crowd are female. Uh, we got people from Asian backgrounds, African-American backgrounds, Latino backgrounds, all sorts of different other European backgrounds. And the youngest person going up there to testify next week is 10 years old. We have several that are in junior high and high school, which make up 12 members of the team. We have people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. We have Chris Chang that will be with us, and he is from America's Top Shot, former Google employee. Um, he's also uh, head of the, the Asian um, Pacific Gun Owners of America group. They'll be with us. We have women from the DC Project, which is now Women for Gun Rights, which is a national wide organization. They're with us. Sam will be talking up there with our groups. Uh, we have uh, Keely Hopkins, who's the new NRA rep. She will be meeting with our groups. So this is a very big umbrella, very focused group that will be meeting with 40 legislators in one day. Uh, you know, it's exciting to see people coming together because for so long it's been sort of, it's been a tough road to hoe. So I'm very, very grateful to hear that news. Rick, we've gone quite a long time here. Is there anything we haven't talked about that we should talk about this time around? No, my biggest thing is to all of you, it's time to get involved. And whether that's join, you know, Gun Owners of California to CRPA, whether that's uh, donating money, which always helps in this fight, um, and we use your money. Directly, none of us have fancy yachts, take trains, planes, automobiles anywhere. We just don't do that. Um, and if you uh, want to get involved and be boots on the ground, you can. We have many, many programs that we can plug you into that you're honestly going to feel like at the end of the day you help move the ball. And I think that's what everybody's looking for, Joel. Yeah, I would tend to agree with you. Rick, thank you very much for coming on the show again. Have a great week and stay safe, brother. You too. God bless. Thank you very much for watching the whole video. I'm super grateful for everything you do. Do check out the Practical Defense Systems YouTube channel. It's also on Rumble. Uh, so I would urge you to go to Rumble, honestly. But check it out. I do put some training videos up there. Practical Defense Systems is the company I own. If you'd like to really support Gun Guy TV, come take a class with us. You'll find it at pdsclasses.com. And yes, there is a link in the description. Have a great week. Thank you again for all of your support. And wherever you go, whatever you do. Stay safe.